Hi, I'm Lee Nish, pastor of Sparks United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship and welcome to this series of messages entitled Faith and Politics. Yeah, that's right. We're wading into the deep end of the pool and maybe getting ourselves into a little bit of trouble because, you know, people think, well, you should never mix faith and politics. Actually, just the opposite is true. If our faith cannot inform our politics, our faith is really not good for much of anything. And today we're going to wade a little farther into the deep end of the pool by examining two different and I would say divergent uh, courses of Christianity. One is called Christian idealism and the other is called Christian realism. And why are we examining that? Because the crux of that dynamic is where we find ourselves in our political life today. Welcome to worship. Let the walls fall down. Let the walls fall down. Let the walls fall down. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that the good does not dwell within me that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do the good lies close at hand, but not the ability. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law, at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind I am enslaved to the law of God, but with my flesh I am enslaved to the law of sin. Like I mentioned previously, we're about ready to wade into the deep end of the pool, which is not a bad metaphor for being a very, very hot summer, not only in terms of climate, but also in terms of our political life as we move towards elections in the fall. And so what I'd like to suggest is maybe even worse than moving into the deep end of the pool would be moving into the swamp because that's what it feels like right now. 
with this seemingly new eruption and let's just say this is the elephant in the room and I'm just going to identify it right off the bat. This newfound, newfangled movement called Christian nationalism. Now, if you've not heard of Christian nationalism, you've steered clear of newspapers, magazines, TV news, uh, everything you possibly could steer clear of because it's, uh, well, it's been very flagrant with us, particularly since the uh, destruction an in, in, in assault on the Capitol uh, on January 6th, several years ago. And that's factoring into our conversation today. But let me uh, just share with you this uh, note from Reverend Angela Decker, who writes what I think is the crisp, mo most crisp uh, definition of Christian nationalism. She says, Christian nationalism is a version of the idolatrous theology of glory which replaces the genuine worship of God with worship of a particular vision of America. Often rooted in a revolutionist history of white people in the 1950s, before the civil rights movement or the women's movement, Christian nationalism supports a violent takeover of government and the imposition of fundamentalist Christian beliefs on all people. Christian nationalism relies on a theological argument that equates American military sacrifices with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. It suggests that Christians are entitled to wealth and power in contrast to Jesus' theology of the cross, which reminds Christians that they too have to carry their cross, just as our crucified Savior did. So if you've not heard of Christian nationalism, I think that is about as succinct uh, an expression of what we're dealing with today. And how did Christian nationalism come on the scene? Well, we have to go back a little bit to really begin to trace some of the culture that has grown in and around Christianity. I like to think sometimes of culture uh, as being like the barnacles on the hull of a ship. The ship is seaworthy. The ship has to sail ahead. And the ship of Christianity does sail ahead, but sometimes the barnacles of culture get in the way. And we are all susceptible to those cultures. Let me give you an, existence, uh, an, ex, uh, an example. Uh, one of the ways that Roman Catholicism really kept focus on Jesus and the Jesus movement was to make the mass the center of Catholic worship. Did the priest or does the priest preach a homily? Yes, but it's usually very short and the most, the, the largest part of worship in a Catholic church is the liturgy of the mass where people respond to priest and priest leads the people. And so everything is written out pretty well cut and dried. And when you go into a Catholic church, you pretty much know what you're going to expect is going to become real. But if you go into a Protestant church, oh my goodness, it's much, much different based on the breadth of theological understandings today, uh, one church right down the street from another may not look, feel, sense, or sound at all like each other. And why is that? Well, without direct and strict denominational structures, Protestant churches are really quite fluid. And Christianity has really been quite fluid down through the centuries. Let's just take a look at our experience here in the United States. Uh, Christianity spread pretty quickly across the country uh, with denominations like uh, the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, others planting churches in communities as the frontier expanded west. But even in the midst of that, there were uh, occasions that were called Great Awakenings. In the United States, there are three Great Awakenings. Uh, some people count four Great Awakenings, 
where people began to sense uh, a more free understanding of following Christ than what was being prepared and presented from the pulpit. Uh, the first great awaken awakening came in the midst of the, uh, of the American Revolution, uh, the second on the cusp of the Civil War, uh, the third around uh, the turn of the century, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then the fourth, if there is possibly a fourth, around uh, the 1970s and on. So let me just unpack a little bit about that. Uh, in, in 1906, which was actually, you could say, the launch of the Third Great Awakening, uh, a revival took place at the uh, church on Azusa Street down in Los Angeles that uh, let loose what many would call the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it was really not necessarily the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, but the explosion of the Pentecostal movement. And that meant feeling a sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit, at, aside from and sometimes in conflict with what mainline churches were teaching and preaching. In fact, our own denomination, uh, Methodism at the time, really could not quite embrace this Pentecostal revolution. And so a brand new denomination was created as people separated from the Methodist Church. This denomination is the Church of the Nazarene. Many of you probably live in communities where you'll, you'll find a Church of the Nazarene. Now today, maybe the Pentecostal expressions aren't quite as vivid as they were around the turn of the century. But still, if you go into a Nazarene church, as opposed to United Methodist Church, you're gonna find a, a, a bit more of a sense of fluidity in terms of following the spirit and perhaps less in terms of following the doctrine and the, uh, uh, the history and tradition of the Christian church. Well, that tendency from 1906 on tended to grow, uh, particularly during uh, the depression years of the late 1929 and 1930s, uh, because the economy had a lot to do with how people were experiencing not only their faith, but their government. And you might be interested to know that in the late 1930s and 1940s, uh, when the Social Security Act was passed, that act was actually led by uh, a group of people, mainly from churches, uh, the person who was in charge, an Episcopalian by the name of uh, Francis Perkins, was uh, working directly with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it was commonly understood that when the churches, primarily mainline churches, were advocating for a Social Security Act, it was an advocacy for the common good over against individual freedom. And this became a dividing point because the Pentecostal movement was much more about individual freedom, the mainline churches much more about the common good. Now let's advance that argument a little farther. I came along in the, in the 1970s uh, and just before that when I was in high school, it was the very cusp of what was called the Jesus movement. And this, during the 1970s, is what some call the Fourth Great Awakening, or the, the, the decrease in mainline Protestant theology and the increase in evangelical Christianity. I remember in the, uh, in the late 1970s, when I was in seminary, for, for a little bit of time, I dated a girl who was really quite evangelical, even to the point where she engaged in glossolalia, which means speaking in tongues. Now, that never really uh, caused a division in our relationship. But when I asked her about speaking in tongues, she would just revert to tongue speech as easily as breathing the air. And for her, that was part of the fluidity of Christianity that she experienced from her church culture a much different experience than I had growing up and staying in the mainline Protestant church. But even uh, in the mainline Protestant church, there were uh, a number of critics as well. Uh, there was uh, a, a degree of suspicion on the part of many Christians that uh, the Christian church was becoming too humanistic 
In fact, you might remember reading things from Francis Schaeffer in the 1970s and 1980s about uh, secular humanism. This was something that apparently was felt to be taken over many of our mainline churches. Again, because of an emphasis on the common good over personal freedom. And then we advance and find that uh, during the 1960s and 70s, a lot of white Protestant churches were really trying to stave off uh, the, uh, uh, the racist uh, language that was coming across and, and trying, to, trying to keep the old ways of the South. And, and so if you were born into a white Protestant church in the South and grew up in that culture, it would have been much different than the culture that I grew up in in central Pennsylvania in the, in the uh, mid-Atlantic states. Same, uh, same religion, so to speak, Christianity, but a much different form, a much more fluid form of Christianity. And then we continue uh, through the 60s and 70s where a lot of the foment that came from the Vietnamese protesters was started in the Christian churches. A lot of the foment that came from uh, the civil rights movement started in the Christian churches. Martin Luther King Jr. and Ebenezer Baptist Church. Many of you know that history. And so church and government oftentimes played similar roles in going towards similar outcomes. For instance, the civil rights legislation of the 1965 and 66 era. But as that happened, white Protestant Christianity found itself over against the mainline church. And so you had people like Jerry Falwell and others who started Liberty University uh, to begin a whole new way of understanding Christianity that was not a part of struggling for the common good, but a part of declaring personal freedom. And so as that divide continued, what we saw was a divide between the evangelical churches and the mainline Protestant churches. Now the United Methodist Church is very much a mainline Protestant church, and for a while, the attendance in the mainline churches decreased while the evangelical church attendance was increasing. But not so much anymore. All churches are decreasing in attendance, uh, even to the point where, for the most part, the greater percentage of the population in the United States now declare themselves non-churched. Now that doesn't mean we're gonna shut down tomorrow, but what it means is we need to figure out a better way to describe what I have set to describe at the very beginning of this message is the difference between Christian idealism and Christian realism. Christian idealism is a way of understanding that everything, including government, should reflect Christian values. Everything in this country should be based on Christian values. Our history books should be rewritten based on Christian values. In fact, we should disperse Bibles in classrooms, which is, I understand, something that's being done now in the state of Tennessee. Uh, all of this because people hold as an ideal the Christian faith. Many people who are um, anti-abortion are anti-abortion because they're Christian idealists. They feel like there, there is no wiggle room between right and wrong or left and right. On the other hand, Christian realists are the ones who admit that there is no clean path to betterment. They're the ones who, who usually say, we can never do just one thing. It's messy to be a Christian and live in the United States today. Who should we vote for? What acts should we get behind? What legislation is appropriate? These are not easy questions, they're complex questions. And the moment we try to make them easy by simply saying, if it doesn't square with my Christian faith, it's not gonna happen, that's Christian idealism. Christian realism is a matter of saying, I'm ready to compromise. 
if we can do something for the common good at this point, maybe in the future we can do something else for the common good. If you want to get right down to it, I think our scripture today from Romans pretty well examines Christian realism. And these words come from St. Paul. I think these words are some of the most honest words Paul has ever spoken in his anguish over how to be a Christian in the midst of a very complex culture. I'm going to just repeat a few of these words uh, from chapter 7, beginning with verse 18. Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. I want you to underscore the, those words, evil lies close at hand. I just simply want to ask you to reflect and ponder on this. Do you think it would have ever been Jesus' action to overtake a government? Jesus refused to do it when Rome ended up crucifying him. Why would Jesus instruct Christians to overtake the government of the United States today with violence, no less? We live in a day and an age when people are getting very confused about what their faith has to say about their politics. And so, as I mentioned in the first part of this series, I want to re-mention re today, you need to jump in and be part of the argument. You need to examine exactly what your faith is telling you. And it is telling you to make a contribution toward the common good, Christian realism, or is it telling you to make a contribution toward individual freedom, Christian idealism? Now, I've tried to boil it down in a very short message, but that's kind of where we are in our culture today. And a lot depends on people like you and me being ready to engage in that argument. you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we know in our better moments that nothing good dwells within us, that is, in our flesh. We know that while we can will what is right, oftentimes we just cannot do it. For we do not do the good we want but the evil that we don't want is what sometimes we do. Now, if I do what I do not want, 
and we do what we do not want. It's no longer us that do it, but sin that dwells within us. O Lord, let us be at peace knowing that sin is always lurking in our midst. It is part of the flesh of who we are. It is our very being. But let us also never give ourselves over fully to that sin because, as Paul reminded us, evil lies close at hand. May the evil that is lying close at hand this day be rejected. And may your light shine upon us and upon our nation. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to say when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for worship today. And thanks for hanging in there on what is probably a longer message than I usually preach. But it's been long because I wanted to help you and others understand that Christian nationalism just didn't happen in the last 10 years. It's actually been the progression of a long line of decisions that have caused people to split in terms of different camps in Christianity. And now, now, it threatens to split our democracy itself. Friends, this can't happen. I really want you to pray hard about your role in engaging in others in the argument that is before us. It is that time. And I believe with the way your faith equips you, you will be able to stand and face the politics of our day. As you do that, you will be blessed. And I believe you will also bless this nation. Go change the world. Thank you for joining us online for worship at Sparks UMC. You can connect with us through our website, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If you're nearby on a Sunday morning, feel free to join us for in-person worship at 9 or 10.30 a.m. Our prayer team is ready to pray for you upon receiving your request via email or by scanning the code displayed on the screen. To stay updated on Sparks UMC community events, scan the QR code or fill out a connect card on our website to receive the bulletin board by email. Your support for our outreach ministries and mission is greatly appreciated. You can contribute by scanning the code or visiting our website at sparksumc.org. So until next time, may you be blessed. <laughs>